Hey Marvin, uh, uh, I'm Jan from Viking Aircraft Engines and uh, we're in Goshen, Illinois, is that correct? Goshen, Indiana. Indiana, uh -huh. okay. A lot of snow here. <laughs> and then the last few, now today is about five or six or seven degrees. Yep. Um, but the last few days we've been in the negative. Now I guess you were down south, so maybe you... Yeah. Yeah. You, uh, you drive RVs for a living? You yeah, I deliver. Deliver, RVs. yeah. Yep. And what made you build a Zenit, uh, being a, a deliver person of, record, of RVs, and now you've got a beautiful Zenit 650 in a hangar here, and you've got a nice corner unit here I saw, and you really got it made, don't you? Yeah. I, used to, I built a gyrocopter 10 years ago, and then I couldn't really afford it, but uh, some guy gave me an offer, I sold it. But and I thought the flying bug had left me and everything, but if you don't have an airplane or something, it'll come back sometimes. <laughs> and I saw that I could, and the Zenith was easy enough to build and everything, but uh, of course I would have to have an engine. So I went on the web to research and stuff, and uh, I was looking for an automotive paste or, or something like that, you know. So when I saw about the Honda, I, I, I knew that would be the kind of engine I'd want, you know. And how's that process been for you? Like you, from, from building the plane to installing the engine uh, to now flying it and, and having about 30 hours on it, um, how has the whole process been for you? I, I love building the plane and putting the engine on. Uh, on my gyrocopter, I put a fuel-injected, turbocharged Subaru engine on it. So I had a little bit of experience, you know. I, I, that was an automotive engine, you know. And uh, I like water cool, you know. Now when you did the gyro, um, what type of gyro was it? It was a Barnett two place. Okay. Barnett J4B2 is what it was called. Now tell us about uh, what you know about your, your engine. Show us a few things around on the engine. Well, this engine, the thing that impresses me the very most about the engine is the fuel economy. When you're flying, I always measure how much fuel I, I got in the tanks. And when I come back, I do my subtraction and adding and stuff. And it, it's almost always less than four gallons per hour. And I can't hardly believe that. Right. So it's now, very I efficient. Don't, I don't fly full throttle. Yeah, it's very efficient. A person, you know, and the more efficient is, the further you can fly. And, you know, you could fill up both, both wing tanks and you could go a long ways. Right, right. Further than I thought. So you like the fuel efficiency. Yep, and I also like the power. And I know it has more torque. The airplanes that I did training in, they were just starved for horsepower. And this thing's got all the horsepower I need compared to those. They were rated at 100, but I think they were like 85, if that. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of that going on, you yeah. know. And, and there's also things like manufacturers might not ex be outright lying. Uh, they might, in fact, believe that their engine puts out that, or they might, in fact, be correct that the engine is putting out that. But then you put it in a real-world airplane, and you cannot get the RPM, uh, or, or you have to turn such a small propeller to get the RPM that the actual usable thrust at the propeller flying is now what what you could really use. Um, so now, what do you have, a, a direct drive or a gear drive? Obviously, I have uh, a it, reduction gear drive on here. Uh huh. Yep. And it doesn't weigh a lot. Most of the time, when you get a reduction gear drive, I know it weighs a lot. This one, I'm satisfied with, it's very good. I, it's two point something, I'm not sure what it is. Right, the I ratio. Yeah. How do you operate the engine? What, what's the procedure like? Um, you go to the airport, you, you, you get in your plane, and, you, and what's, what's the procedure? What, what kind of procedure do you follow um, between getting to the airport and then um, getting ready to fly and then starting the engine and getting up in the air? Well, I, first thing I do is I check my I gas, you know, or I put gas in it. And I, I check each wing tank, making sure my uh, fuel is circulating, you know, mm -hmm. by switching tanks, you know and making sure it's not running out the vent tank, you know. And you mean by that, uh, because the engine has a return system, yeah. that some fuel is brought from the wing tanks yeah. and then back to the engine again. And you can test that. Yeah. 
mm -hmm. I can open the cap and I can see the fuel returning here and I can hear the fuel pump running. One time I had fuel coming out the vent because the return thing is at the top of the tank and it was hitting, it was spraying in a certain way and it, it started making it come out so I had to open up the wing and I had to replumb that. Okay. The other wing hasn't done that yet. but So that's something for other people to maybe learn from your experience. Uh, where would you, where would you um, route your return to now if you were to redo it? You could put it anywhere except where it was put. You could put it at the bottom of the tank fuel return or you can put it at the top. You can put it inboard. You can put it anywhere because it will be pushed back. Right. But it was right up here is where the vent is that goes out the bottom and the fuel return was shooting right up against it. Okay. And this was a, a bung that was already in the tank? It came yep. that way? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I did tell them about that. They don't, no longer put it in the same place. I see. Somewhere else. Okay. Very good. So you check your fuel. What else? Uh, what Now, per pertinent to the, like you were doing, to the engine, right. what are the things that you might want to, that you check on a routine basis? And we're just trying well, to, for other people to learn from what you have seen so far. If the, uh, you know, the weather, the weather has to be favorable. If I go anywhere, I'm only flying for fun, mm -hmm. so I don't need to take any risk, you know. Right. If the weather's like over 17 mile an hour side wind or something, I'm probably not going to go fly. But if it might be a headwind taking off on the runway, yeah, I, I would, you know. Maybe. Right, right. Um, and then, I, I, use, I often look at my engine and stuff, you know. Okay. I like, look it over really good. Okay. Quick inspection, I look at the engine more than I look at the airplane. Well, there's more moving parts on an engine than there is on, a, uh, on an airframe. Usually an airframe, once you build it, it would take years for bushings and bolts and stuff to wear out mm -hmm. uh, versus an engine. Um, you've got a rotating th things that rotate. You've got an alternator that's spinning. You've got, uh, you've got more systems associated with an engine, so that does make sense. Yeah, and I just look it over, you know, and I look for a missing bolt or anything like that. Which, you know, I, I just try to look it all over and everything and make sure everything looks good. No leaks and stuff, you know. Okay. And are you happy with the overall, uh, all your choices as far as uh, building a Zenith 650 and selecting a Viking engine? And, and uh, is there anything you would have done differently if you were to do it again? No. Uh, not anything that I would have done differently. Not really. Uh, definitely the Viking engine, the price is right, you know, it's very affordable. I can't build an engine like this. I can't get an engine like this anywhere for this price, you know, that has this performance. And, and do you engine. feel like by selecting the Viking engine that your engine somehow is inferior to, to engines costing twice as much? Absolutely not, no, no. Okay. No. I, uh, fuel injected, that's going to be the best fuel economy. It's going to run the best. It's going to, I, I don't have a carb heat and mixture and stuff like that. Computer takes care of that, you know. And uh, it runs on an ECU. And ECUs have been around since 1976 or before that even. My first car, uh, one of my first cars, a 1976 Chrysler Cordova, the computer failed. And that was 1976. Right. So we're way up beyond that. Computers are solid state, no moving parts. And, you know, I just don't hear of any of them ever failing. Any, yeah. And then you have a backup, I take it. Yeah, I have mm -hmm. a backup fuel pump yeah, and a backup. If you go to that side and I go over here, could we take a, a look inside your airplane? Oh. oh, that engine's definitely not too heavy. <laughs> oh, look at that. That's a, nice, that's a nice panel. That's a nice touch with the yellow. I like that. Yellow and black. It looks nice. And I use, I use an iPad with iHood here. And there I've got another iPad. I can interchange anything up any way I want to. Uh, there's a, a module, AHRS module, which is located behind the pilot seat, and that transmits Wi-Fi to the iPad. 
And then I have the engine information system. Yeah, which is very similar to our our Viking view uh -huh. um, that we also that that Viking has, which is exactly the same instrument, but it's pre-programmed and it shows you a little bit more about the engine. And I had to pre-program this one. Yeah. And uh, that just about wrecked my brain to do it. But then it took a while for me to completely learn how to do it. But I wanted old style fuel gauges because I really wanted to see what I got in there, you know? Right, and you can kind of tell with those um, if they're accurate in the sense, at least to the point where either they're full when you fill it and then they kind of come down, yeah. or if they start becoming erratic, then you can tell if there's something wrong with and them. And each mark here, two gallons, four gallons, six gallons. Okay. And then it doesn't show when it's completely full, you know, but I measured it out very carefully and everything. All right, and then now you've got, um, what do we got for switches as far as getting, let's say, powering up the airplane and you can just kind of show it. Okay. And, and then he... um, this one, mm -hmm. it actually comes on now, we're charging the battery. That turns everything off. Okay. And here is avionics and uh, in instruments, which would be this and okay. this. And then this is radio. This is strobe and navigation lights, which are both hooked together. And this is taxi and uh, run. Uh, well, the, the, the really light. unique thing about what I'm seeing here, of course, is your choice of um, a, an engine monitor and then iPad instrumentation. Mm -hmm. I don't see any other gauges anywhere. Right. And you've got your uh, real radio, yep. your engine instruments, and uh, superior navigation through the uh, iPad 1 and iPad 2. Uh -huh. Now, as far as the iPad navigation, uh, any issues there? Um, do the iPads... Uh, uh, you can read them properly. Do they overheat? Uh, you haven't really flown in, in really hot summer I, days, maybe. Uh, uh, I can charge them and everything. Okay. Uh, the one iPad, the, one is different than the other one. one. Okay. One can get hot. The other one never gets hot. So the new one, maybe, is the one that uses the most electricity? No, uh, the newer one never gets hot. The older oh. one, it gets hot. The one I use for mapping, yeah. That one gets hot. That one is also cellular. The one I use here is just Wi-Fi. Never gets hot. So that's something people might want to uh, keep in mind then. I think the newer ones probably don't get as hot. Okay. I think so. Okay. Well, that's wonderful. Um, thank you so much for showing us your airplane. Um, we're, you haven't been out by your plane for the last uh, couple of weeks because you were on a business trip. So the batteries are down a little bit. We're going to recharge those. And uh, Viking is here to visit with you and uh, uh, David Muller over here, like, like a snowman today, <laughs> all packed up, uh, in order to um, get the engines to crank and start easy in the snow and in the cold. So um, we'll give it a few more minutes charging and then uh, we'll get you some uh, updated software that we already uh, worked out on David's airplane and we'll get it started up. Thanks again. Oh, you're heating, you're heating the engine? Don't heat the engine, we're doing testing. <laughs> and then we also have uh, uh, my friend now, I've been here long enough and stayed at your house, Dave Mullet, and you have, uh, this is not your airplane, but you have the exact same engine in your... RV-12. Okay. And um, how is, how is, how has your... Um, like, how did you get to be an RV-12 owner and a Viking owner, and what's your past history in aviation? Uh, I have a commercial pilot license, and uh, I bought the RV-12 from a guy out east who had given up on the kit, and I started looking around for an engine, and I was impressed with what I was seeing with this Viking engine being fuel-injected and uh, the power that it's got. So I put it in, and... Uh, a friend of mine helped me and took it out and got it inspected by the DAR and flew it. And I couldn't believe the performance that I got out of the engine. It, uh, the airplane gets in the, off into the air immediately. Uh, the top speeds were about what I expected. And uh, Now we went flying just yesterday and what kind of speeds did we see? And now you don't have any wheel pants. That's correct. Okay. 
Uh, 140. Okay. And uh, it uh, seemed to stall at what uh, Van says it should stall at, uh, about 40 miles an hour with the flaps out. Our approach speeds were 70 miles an hour with this, uh, with two notches of flaps on, it seemed to land uh, very good at that, that speed. Okay. And uh, so you bought the, the, the shell, let's just say, of the RV-12, and then you finished it from there. You, you equipped it um, with instrumentation and with an engine from Viking. And, uh, yeah, I have a Viking view, the engine monitor, which uh, comes pre-programmed, which is great because you don't have to sit down and figure out all that stuff and program it in and hope that you've got it right because it's set when you get it. Okay, okay. So that's what Marvin was saying, that he, he got the, the regular EIS and he had to go through a, a manual to learn how to do it. That's correct. And now he's an expert at it. <laughs> okay, any other... Uh, now, what's your past uh, experience in aviation as far as small airplanes? Cause well, in uh, Cess Cessna's one, I have Cessna 150 and flown 172s and Diamonds and Jabru's and... Uh, also a Piper Aero, which I took my check right in for my commercial license. And what are your future plans for your RV-12 flying? Well, uh, as soon as I, the weather changes, I'm going out to California to see my son. Okay. So that'll be a trip of about 15, 1700 miles. I'm not exactly sure, nautical miles. I'm not exactly sure at this point. So that's why you keep asking about mountain flying. That's correct. <laughs> Stay away from the mountains. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you both uh, for purchasing Viking engines and doing such a good job of installing them. And uh, you guys have somewhat uh, become friends. You live very close to each other. You have the same type of, uh, in fact, the RV-12 is very similar to the Zenit 650. It's more of a choice. You, you build one or you build the other. But they're both low-wing airplanes. Uh, right now, they're both in uh, shiny aluminum. Um, and you have the same engine and you live... Uh, 10 minutes apart by air and 30 minutes by car, so uh, you can help each other out. All right. Yep.